on our laptop. Okay. We need to uh, document certain things at the school, so we're going to end up doing it uh, for uh, online surveys at the beginning and then the certain class. And we tested it out. Uh, a couple of students, about 15 students, tested it out on the phone or laptop on the last two nights and seemed to work fine. If you had previously done a test, those things have been deleted, so we're going to ask you to look at that. Um, if you pull out either your phone or your laptop, anyone not have something? One person? Uh, you want to go, yeah, you want to go grab, you want to grab, you got a whole phone? <laughs> then, uh, then, uh, then what you can do is after someone else does it on the web, you can do it on the phone. Okay. Now, this, this is different than the other survey? Same thing, but it's cleaned out. Okay. So if you go to the school homepage, www.famu.edu backslash architecture, there'll be a button. So, so I go to www.famu.edu backslash architecture, if I spell it right. On the left hand side, you'll see a series of buttons. On the bottom left button, does it say survey? Click on that button, it'll take you to the survey. The survey, I believe this is six questions. Okay. Survey is six questions. One thing to be clear on is there's a difference between a profile and a record. A profile is for free. A record you start to pay for. So if you say to people, oh I have an IDP account and you never paid anything. You probably have a profile, correct? <laughs> okay. You didn't pay anything, but you signed up for something and you get info. You probably have a profile. Okay. So on the bottom left, you see survey, hit start, and there are about six questions. So to be real clear, so it asks you, do you have a profile? Parentheses free. And then it asks you, do you have a record? And then there's a description of the record. So just a few questions. And if you're going to do it after we break, so this is what it looks like. You just ask me a few questions. Oh, academic standing. In turn, do you have a profile? That's the free thing. Do you have a record? That's when you start to pay. Have you completed hours? Is different than actually submitting the hours. Don't ask me too many questions, that's why I'm nicking At the end, we just want to confirm your family students and put your name in at the bottom. Okay? And you're filling out that question. Sure. Do the record, record versus the scroll up on it. Do you have a record? What is a profile? Oh, sorry. What is a record? What is a record? I'll edit that probably in the next half hour. You, you don't even know? Just say, I don't know. Don't lie. It's not a test. There's no grade. If you do not know, say you do not know. We need to know if your answer is yes, no, or I do not know. We don't think there's a student. When we ask people what studio you're in, we don't think there's an I don't know. Please fix. If you, if you do not have a good understanding, if you have a poor understanding of IDP, you have a great understanding, please to honestly please. We want to see where students are generally. Do you have a profile? Do you have a record? Have you completed hours? Maybe you don't know, you're not sure. That's fine. Tell us what you think. And have you submitted the hours? Please put in your first name and last name so we can. That and then we'll confirm you as student. Okay? Yes. Nick? What? Yes, Nick. <laughs> now, when this ends, do not save your questions and decide you'll ask him afterwards. Okay? Please don't. Ask now while everyone's here. Okay? Don't hold the questions. Okay? That doesn't do anyone any good. If you've, been in, if you've been in my class, I typically say, if you don't ask a question for everyone, I'm not going to answer it. So ask your question. Okay? And uh, probably when I disappear, you'll see me go upstairs and ask a lot of those students why aren't they here. And they're the ones that are trickling late. And they're the ones why we do the survey before and after. So, okay?
But if you can log it, whether you're currently in the graduate program, fifth year, fourth year, third year, second year, first year, we're curious about your awareness of IDP, where you are with it, if you feel like you have a good or bad understanding, because I think based on uh, Nick's uh, presentation, you'll understand that this is something that should be of interest to everyone from first year on. But we really, really, really want to make sure that as students are in their final year of a degree or in a professional program, they have a very clear understanding of it. So I think we'll also give other things. There's a possibility that also under the impression we started converting we did that's why I help you. Can I back out anyway? Oh, yeah, I'll just close that. Oh, at the end, we'll do it again. My phone is broken a while, so I'm going to try to start the front. Okay. Uh, we're really fortunate today uh, to have a mix surface from uh, NCARB. Uh, NCARB uh, is the organization that you work through to uh, record your IDP hours and to, uh, if, if when you become registered, you wish to work in other states, you have a folder with them, they're a clearinghouse for licensure where you may able to move between states to practice architecture. Uh, Nick is uh, very much focused on IDP, and uh, we had a visitor about two years ago, Martin Smith is here, and this will be, uh, I don't know, imagining a recurring thing every couple of years. I'm the IDP education coordinator here. If you have any questions about your record or uh, how, to, how to do this, uh, come see me. Uh, we have uh, a little effort going on to have everybody have a profile. Uh, how many folks in here have an IDP profile? That just, just signed up, not an account, not paid any money, but just a profile. Okay. Uh, those of you that haven't, you should do this. Just get a profile. What that does is it allows you to get information that is in and about registration the IDP program and uh, keeps you up to date. It doesn't cost anything. Okay. All right, Nick, one, two, three. All right, sounds good. Thanks for coming out, guys. I appreciate it. Um, just a, a real quick poll for me so I know who I'm speaking to and, and I can make sure I, I target everything appropriately. How many of you are in a graduate program here? Two or three year? Wow, most of you. Oh, anybody in the undergrad in the fifth year? The BR? One, okay. What about undergrad fourth year? Few less than that, third, second, or first. Anybody? Couple there too. Okay, cool. Um, so that helps a little bit for me as we go through. Uh, today, for the most part, I'm going to go over the entire licensure process, uh, education, experience, and exam, all the rules, all the regulations, all that stuff. Uh, for some of you, you may already kind of know it a little bit. You've been in it. Maybe you have some hours. Maybe you've been working towards you know completion already. Um, and some of you, uh, I assume, most of the, the first, second, and third years in the room probably. Probably haven't started at all yet. So um, I'm going to try to give you an overview as well as provide some strategies and some tactics so you guys can actually apply some things once you get out and start you start working on this stuff. Um, but what we're going to see for the most part today are a lot of rules and regulations because that's the program ultimately. But I think it's important to kind of set the broader context for you in terms of, of your career because really this is not just about the next year, or the next three years, or the next five years, it's about the next 30 years of your career. And then how you proceed down that path in the next 30 years, and then the opportunities and hopefully the rewards that, that come with it. And so to kind of paint the picture a little bit for you, I want to tell you a little bit about my story and why I'm even here and how I got to be here. Um, my undergrad degree is in foreign affairs, completely unrelated to, to architecture, design, all that stuff. Uh, I took one architecture course uh, in my undergrad. It was the second semester of my senior year. Uh, it was the best course I took in four years. Uh, but I walked out of that exam saying to myself, well, that's too bad. I'm, I'm never going to get a chance to do that again. And uh, I went to work for a large corporate law firm, which is kind of what you do when you have a foreign affairs degree. Um, you either get into politics somehow or you go work for a law firm. 
So I did that, thought I might go to law school and that might be my, my path through life. Uh, but I got out and I started talking to some of the young attorneys. And um, one of them in particular, he was in his second year at the time, doing really well for himself, six-figure salary, everything seemed great. Um, and he was talking to me about going back to law school. And he told me, he said, Nick, he said, I calculated my hourly wage for my first year at the firm here. And he said, it actually came out to $3.69 an hour. And so at that point, I decided I needed a more lucrative career than what the law could offer me. So I switched to architecture, which is a joke. If you don't start laughing now, it's going to be a long 45 minutes. <laughs> then I started making two sixty nine an hour. That's great. No, in all seriousness, I wanted to be more creative. Kind of thought I could give back more to the world uh, by, by going to architecture. So um, I actually went to... Uh, close your, your ears for a second. The, the program down in Coral Gables did a three and a half year MR at the University of Miami. Uh, had a great time, uh, loved it down there. Uh, but after I was done, I was kind of done with South Florida, so I came back to where I was from, which was Richmond, Virginia. And I started working for a large local firm there doing healthcare design. Now, if you know anything about healthcare, there's a lot of crazy, cool, sexy projects going on in healthcare right now. Uh, China has a lot of cool stuff going on. South America's building great stuff. Uh, even, even here in the States. I was doing none of that. Um, I was doing the guts of the hospital, the complex equipment installations, interior renovations, that type of thing. I have one project of which I'm particularly proud. It's one drawing, it has an arrow and it says patch wall. That's it. Good <laughs> I'm telling you. No, but in all seriousness, the good thing about that experience was not necessarily the portfolio I took from it, which is virtually nil. Um, but the fact that I got a broad range of experience really early on in my process. This firm put me in front of clients, in front of contractors, in front of engineers, almost from day one. I was doing every little piece and part of the project, literally from the first month I started, which was really cool and really great for me because it helped me go through this whole process that you guys are going to see today fairly quickly and fairly efficiently. And I say that up front because as you guys start to look at summer internships, or maybe your, you know, your first architecture job when you graduate, whatever it is, I want you to think about the bigger picture and not just the cool projects and the firms that win awards and the firms that show up on websites all the time, but think about your experience that you're going to have over those first you know, two or three years, because that's really going to inform the next five and ten years of your career, um, more so than just saying that you, know, you did a few details on a really cool symphony project somewhere, or you know, the next skyscraper, you did some of the foundation work. Think about the broader context in your overall experience, not just the projects that you'll get a chance to, to touch. Um, so I finished up, I earned my license pretty quickly, and I started a little in-house mentoring group. Uh, that group did pretty well. We won a national award, and, and I met some of the folks at, at NCARB through that process. And then about five years ago, I came on board with NCARB at the time, and I've been doing this kind of thing, uh, going to schools and conferences and colleges and and uh, doing some committee work and customer service and all kinds of, of, of crazy stuff. Um, so I tell you that because I think it highlights that you just never really know where your career is going to go, right? Like, I never thought I was going to be an architect. That was never in my path up until I graduated college, actually. And then once I was an architect, I never thought I'd be in front of you guys doing this kind of thing. And this is completely off the radar from what an architect would normally do. So you just never know. So how do you prepare for that unknown? And I think one of the best ways to prepare for that unknown is to set yourself up with as many qualifications or credentials as you can so that when that right opportunity comes your way, whatever it is, you can take advantage of it. Whether that opportunity is starting your own firm or moving up in your firm or maybe doing something completely interdisciplinary. You, you know, kind of transition out of architecture and do your own, maybe a web thing or, or you know, who knows what it is. Either way, a credential like that architecture license really positions you to take advantage of whatever that perfect thing is for you. And so that's why I always kind of start with this slide, because I think it highlights that there's a lot more to this than just earning a license, just earning that piece of paper, just going through a, a, a process. There's a line down here I want to touch on real quickly, too. It says, understand your timeline and, and don't wait for life to get simpler. I do presentations all, you know, all over the country for the last five years, and I continually run into folks who are in the latter half of their careers just now starting this process. Now, they didn't transition into architecture in the latter half of their careers. They've been in it since undergrad. 
They just never got around to going through this licensure process. And that's fine. Everybody has a very different path, and people make personal choices along the way to take them in different directions. But I think that if this is a goal for you, and this is the, the, the thing you want to accomplish, starting early and, and hopefully finishing early will help you reap the benefits of, of rewards for hopefully 30, 40 years down the line. The people who wait to the latter half of their career sometimes, you just you know, you shorten that window of opportunity, I think. So think about that as you guys get started with this, to really start paying attention to it early. Again, if it's your goal. If it's not, then you know, by all means. Um, but pay attention to it early so that you can reap the benefits later of, of, of what it brings. Um, a few things before we get into more things, before we get into the rules and, and regulations and all that is, you know, a license affords you certain legal responsibility and authority um, out on site and in, in the firm, of course. But there are certain soft topics up here which I think sometimes are almost more beneficial to you, at least early on in your career. And I want to touch on just a few of them. The first one up here, become an architect. You'll see architect is in quotes. So when you guys get out and you start working, firms will give you all kinds of different titles. Project designer, project manager, team captain, job captain, or maybe intern or intern architect. Okay. Intern is kind of that common term that we use for anybody who's not licensed. Okay? I hate that term. I think it's horrible. Um, typically, it's not viewed well for people outside of the profession. They think you're a summer intern or you're still in school and things like that. But that's what it is. That's what you're called. Um, one story in particular, I was actually out on site with a client and a contractor uh, two years after my master's, and I was introduced to the client as an intern, who then asked me when I was going back to school, what school I went to, kind of thought I was a summer undergrad intern kind of thing. And so literally from that point forward, I decided I was going to go back, knock this out, and get, get it done as quick as I could, if for no other reason than to just get that architect time. That was my motivation. For you, it may be something completely different. Maybe you've always wanted to be an architect. Maybe you want to start your own firm. Maybe you have a promotion waiting for you. Whatever it is, you're going to see that all of the stuff that we're going to talk about today is kind of set up for you to be proactive. So that means that you have to find your own motivation to get through it. And so if your motivation is that title, then great. If it's something else, great. Whatever it is, kind of sink your teeth into it and use it to, to drive you through the process. Two more I want to mention are increased value and, and credibility. The increased value one is, is complex. Sometimes you know, people tell me, you know, Nick, folks aren't any more valuable today after they earn a license as they are the day before. It's kind of a piece of paper. It's kind of something you check off. And, and I get that a little bit. But I think that once you earn a license, you can take on additional roles. You can take on additional responsibilities at your firm. And you may not get a raise the next day or the next month. But hopefully over the course of time, the next six months, the next year, you can really start to assert yourself and, and your skills and your abilities, start to take on more and more, which hopefully then you know, derives increased value. The last one I want to mention is credibility. And this is, I think, the biggest driver for, for all of us, and it, and it certainly was for me. It, um, early on in my career, I, I would go to a lot of AI events or networking events or wherever I could in, in Richmond where I lived just to meet people and kind of network in the profession and whatnot. And I remember going to one event in particular. It was kind of a, a cocktail reception at the top floor of this hotel at the restaurant up there. And I remember walking into the room and big space, and literally as far as the eye could see was people with gray hair. It's far left. That's all I saw, gray hair. So I literally went home that night and told my wife I was dying my hair gray because I was instantly going to get some credibility in this profession. Figured once I did that, Set. It's good to go. That's all I needed. Um, but in all seriousness, what I actually found out is that having that license gave me some of that credibility up front, even though I was fairly young in, in, in the career. And it certainly happened in my firm. I mean, principals recognized it, um, and other you know, more senior people recognized it. But most importantly, it was out on site with contractors and engineers and clients. They didn't know everything about the IDP that you guys are going to see today. and They didn't know all about how many tests there were and, and everything like that. But they knew it was a difficult process. They knew not a lot of folks went through it, at least early on. And so it started to give me a lot of credibility out on site. Um, and that, that was, to me, one of the biggest benefits early on of, of having a license.
So something to think about as you guys are, are taking those first steps. All right, so let's kind of get into uh, a little bit about Enigma. Even for those of you who have already started this process, you may not know everything um, about how the organization works. And I think that may inform your process a little bit. Um, at NCAR, we're one national organization, and our members are, are the 50 state licensure boards for each state, as well as, well as the licensure boards for Puerto Rico, Guam, the Virgin Islands, and D.C. So I like this slide in particular because it shows each state in a little bit of a different color or hue. And that's because at NCAR, we try to put one national process in place for you. So you have one IDP, one ARE, and you kind of have one licensure process. But the states actually administer a license to you. So you'll earn a license here in Florida, maybe one in Mississippi and Georgia and so forth. And each state's a little bit different in terms of how they license folks and what those requirements are. So it's important to know upfront what those differences are, particularly uh, here in Florida, for instance, versus Georgia or Texas or, or California. And as you guys are taking your first steps, ultimately, you pick where you want to earn your licenses, especially your first one. Okay? So one of the things to check out on our website is the registration board requirements page. It has every single state listed there. There's a drop-down menu, and you, know, you can scroll through and see how Florida is different than Virginia and New York and whatnot. For today's presentation, I'm going to assume we're talking about Florida for most of you. Uh, I have a license here in Florida myself, as well as Virginia, so I can hopefully speak to that pretty knowledgeably. But if you have other questions about the differences between states, this is the best place to go. It's there for you. There's also some comparison charts down below if you just don't have a preference and you want to know how the states stack up against each other. Again, the differences are minor. So most of them are just nuances in terms of maybe the education requirement or when you can take the ARE or an additional experience that's needed, something like that. But there are differences, so just be sure to check it out. Also, knowing that there are two organizations you work with, NCARB and your state board, is critically important. You don't have to know all the details and what, what pieces and parts go where, but just knowing that there are two organizations involved is going to make your process much smoother. If you have trouble with NCARB sometimes, we're going to tell you to call the state board. <coughs> sometimes the state board will tell you to call NCARB. Okay? That's okay. You just If you know that up front, you're going to have a much better process. Sometimes you're going to have to you know, call both or call one or the other. All right, so we're going to talk about the three E's today for the most part. Education, experience, and exam. Okay? That's going to hopefully lead you to this registration. But first, I want to talk about how to get started. Um, I know uh, Andrew had asked at the beginning how many folks had a profile and a record. Um, a profile, as he mentioned, is just kind of a free account you set up to get contact information. A record is an actual file you set up so you can start distributing IDP hours. How many folks actually have a record and have started IDP? About half. Okay, cool. Um, so this is our website. Uh, for those of you who haven't seen it before, it's ncarb.org. This blue button, this login section, that's where you go for pretty much everything related to you. Okay, That's going to be where we keep your record. It's going to have all your IDP credentials. It's going to have all your ARE test scores and all your licenses once you start to earn them. Okay? The record you'll have with you for your entire career, okay, it's not going to go away. Okay, so it'll always be there for you when you need to refer back to it. There is a fee for getting started. As Andrew mentioned at the beginning, setting up a profile, which is essentially logging in, giving us your email address so you can get contact information and updates and whatnot, that's free. But actually starting a record and distributing your IDP hours, there is a fee for that. It's $350 to get started, but let's talk about it. That 350 covers your first three years. You don't pay anything else for, for three years. After that three-year period, it's a 75-hour renewal fee. So you know, maybe that's your motivation to get through and finish in three years. Save yourself $75, whatever it is. However, all of you guys are eligible right now to start this process, and we want you to start the process. So there is a student payment option, which hopefully makes it a little bit more palatable. Okay? You can pay $100 up front, it gives you full access to putting in your IDP hours and, and everything like that. And you pay the balance of $250 whenever you're ready to take the test, which is the ARE. <coughs> that could be six months from now when you graduate. That could be six years from now. Okay? Hopefully, by the time you guys get to this point, you're pretty well invested in the process. Okay? You know you're going to you know, get through this. So hopefully that makes sense.
excellent things. All right, so let's start briefly with education. I'm just going to uh, touch on this uh, in a couple aspects, and then we're going to move on to IDP and ARE, which are kind of the, the more difficult, complex areas. Because you guys, frankly, are all working on this right now, and hopefully going to knock this out um, sooner rather than later. So Florida has the requirement that you have a NAB accredited degree. Okay. So what is a NAB accredited degree? That's typically a five-year BR or a two- or three-year MR. So most of you in the room are, are grad students. You either have that two- or three-year MR rolling. You're set. You're good to go. Once you finish this up, uh, you're good to go in every state that you want to go to. That's the most stringent education requirement. Those of you who are fifth years in the BR, you're good to go, too. This is going to be completed as soon as you graduate. Those of you who are in the four-year program, either the fourth, third, second, or first year, you'll have a choice to make at the end of your fourth year. Okay? And that choice is, do you go into the two-year master's right away? Do you go out and work for a while and then go back to a two-year master's? Or do you never pursue that two-year master's, in which case you're not going to be able to earn a license in Florida? Okay? So that's something to consider for those of you who are in the undergrad portion. That, that four-year degree by <coughs> itself is not the accredited portion. It's either the five-year BR or the two- or three-year MR. So keep that in mind as you're starting to make your decisions. If you have questions, please talk to your professors about it. Talk to your guidance counselors about it, whatever it is. So at least you know, you know what your future route is. Okay? We have some guidelines on our website. If you need to know more, they're in there. But frankly, I kind of outlined it for you um, in terms of your specific scenario right now. So that's what it is. And again, that five-year BR or the, the two- or three-year MR, those are the, the three key degrees that qualify here in Florida. So let's talk about IDP, right? Because this is really kind of the meat of the program that you guys are going to get into right now and, and hopefully in the, in the near future when you start working in the summers or graduate. So I'd like to talk a little bit about the history before we get into it, because I think it, it frames it. And the IDP, so you know, started back in the mid-70s. Prior to that point, there was a duration requirement in effect, meaning most states you had to work at least maybe three years or five years, and then you could take your test and earn your license. Well, the issue then was, what really were you doing for three years? You could have been doing the same detail or the same drawing or the same project type over and over and over again, and then you, know, you sit and you earn your license. So what they wanted to do was to create a, a system that allowed you to get a broad range of experience early on in the process. So essentially, you weren't designing toilet elevations for three years in a row and then earning your license. So that is an elevated toilet, and that is that's about as creative as I get. So again, if you're not laughing now, you know, you're screwed. Um, somebody actually pointed out that this is a bidet to me, so I will update the graphic. <laughs> I apologize. I should have my license up. So here it is. Okay, this is again the intent here was to create a structure whereby you earn a broad range of experience early on in your process. Okay. So, real quick, basics, it's 5,600 total hours. That's about three years if you're talking 40 hours a week for 15 weeks a year or so. Okay? It's broken up in two different ways. 1860 is about a year, and that covers elective hours. It can come from any part of architecture you might be doing. Okay? The other 3740 are core hours, and they come in prescribed areas and in prescribed amounts. And that's what you see over here. Before we get into the details and strategy, people always ask me, well, how long does IDP take? What's the average? And we have stats. I can, I can give you a bunch of years, but really it doesn't matter. At the end of the day, when people ask me how long IDP takes, my answer is, well, it takes 5,600 hours. How quickly can you do 5,600 hours? Do you have a supervisor that you work with closely? Are you, have you started this when you were in school? Did you start right away when you graduated, how aggressive were you with the program. At the end of the day, it's 5,600. For some people, that's two years. For some people, that's five years or more. It really just depends on how strategically you go through the process and how you work with your supervisor. So with that said, let's talk about these core hours over here. Okay. There are a lot of different ways to, to get these hours and a lot of strategic things you can do. Because frankly, when you first look at it, it seems like there's a heck of a lot of stuff going on here, right? How am I ever going to get all this done, especially in, in three years or so? Okay? But really, once you actually get out and you start working on projects, a lot of this stuff is just naturally going to happen over the course of the project. 
you're naturally going to do some, some code research. You're naturally going to do some construction documents. Hopefully it gets built and you do some of this project management stuff. So you're going to start to take away at some of these things just, just naturally. However, there are some strategies. And the first one I want to tell you about is strategically using your timesheet and how you record your IDP hours in relation to your timesheet. When you guys get out, you'll probably realize that your firm's timesheets and your billable codes and all that, they don't look exactly like this in most cases. But you may see some common terms here and there, but it's not going to be lined up just like this. So you really have to think and, and, and be crafty about where you put your hours. And so what I see a lot of times is people will take their timesheets, which have 8, 10, or 12 hours a day, build to construction documents. Because that's what you spend a majority of your, maybe your first six months doing. Okay, and that's okay, because construction documents is, it's a hefty requirement. It's 1,200 hours. But over the course of that eight or ten hour day, chances are you looked at a code book several times throughout the day. Chances are you had conversations about costs. Chances are you looked online and pulled a materials cut sheet. Or you talked to the spec guy about something. Uh, maybe you talked to an engineer for 15 minutes over the course of the day. Those kinds of things matter. And as you go in and you document your IDP, I want you to actually break it out that way. Maybe you just take six hours from the day and you put it in construction documents. And then you take 15 minutes and put it in engineering, 15 minutes in codes, and a half an hour in material selection. Because you may not have sat down for an extended period of time and done those things, but over the course of the day, it probably added up and you probably had your head in the code book for a while and on the phone with an engineer for a while. So break it out accurately so that at the end of your two or three years or whatever it is, you've started to chip away at, at some of these requirements. What I don't want to see is that you call me in two or three years and you have 5,000 hours of construction documents and nothing in codes. Okay? First of all, if you've done 5,000 hours of construction documents and never opened up a code book, a little worried about your construction documents. Right? So you really break it up based on what you accurately did. Also, let's say you get everything else done and you're stuck with this 120 hour code requirement and you're done with everything. Well, nobody's ever gonna sit you down and say, hey, for the next 120 hours, just put your head in the code book. It just doesn't work like that, right? It's all kind of gradual, it's all integrated. So you've got to, got to break it out. Also, you've got to ask for what you need. And a lot of it is being proactive and going to your supervisor or identifying things at your firm that you can get involved with. Uh, for me, I literally, the first week I was at my firm, went to my supervisor. And I said, look, I want to do this IDP thing. I know it takes a while and it's complex and it's hard. And, and, but I know that some of this project management stuff particularly is really tough to get. So I said, look, if there's any chance to plug me into you know, a meeting or a site tour or whatever it is, you know, I'll try to make it, make it up in overtime or at lunch or whatever. I, just, I want to get involved as, as early as I can in this, this more complicated stuff. And so what happened was I started getting invited to construction site meetings and construction site tours once a month. Big conference room, big table, everybody's sitting around, contractors, clients, engineers, everybody's there. And I get introduced to the table and then literally I'm told to sit there and be quiet. Riveting, again. Um, <laughs> That happened literally for the first six months, about once a month I would go to these meetings. Um, after that, I started going every couple weeks. I think they liked that I took good notes. I think they liked that I was interested. Didn't really matter to me. Yeah, I needed the hours and, and I was interested, right? <laughs> after about a year, the floodgates kind of opened up. And they said, look, Nick, whatever you got, just let us know. You've been here long enough now. And I noticed two things at that point. First, my drawings back at the office were getting exponentially better. Partially because I've been there for a year, but I also think partially because I knew what kind of conversations they were having in the field now. I wasn't designing in this vacuum anymore. Um, I knew what was important to the client. I knew what was important to the contractor. And I wasn't wasting time on details or elements or issues that everybody knew how to build and everybody knew how it was going to work. I could focus on the things that really matter. Also, the meetings out on site started to go much more smoothly. And I realized at that point that all the drawings we were talking about in most cases, I had done them all myself. So I was there to say, well, this is why that detail looks a little funky. And this is what I was thinking about when I put that element there. And so it really started to help the, the meetings go, go along a little better. 
Once I actually finished up and earned my license, I moved right into a construction role. I realized that's what I like to do, that's what I was good at. Um, I mentioned earlier, I came at this profession kind of laterally. You know, I wasn't always the art design guy. So a lot of this pre-design abstract stuff, I didn't get it then, I still don't get it now. You give me an architect magazine, I can tell you about half the designs in there and what their intention are. Um, intentions are. But at the end of the day, I am good at some of this project management stuff and at talking to contractors and figuring out problems out on site. So I could kind of tailor the next year or two of my career to focus on this. For you, it may be something completely different. Maybe you get out on site and you realize, I, don't, I, don't, I hate this stuff out on site. I don't want to talk to a contractor all day. I don't want to figure out these problems on site. I want to do the pre-design stuff, the upfront design world. That's great. That's fine. At least now, you identified that early on in your process. You didn't work yourself up a ladder to get up to a project manager level where you'd be out on site all day, every day, and then you realize you hate it. What have you been doing for the last 10 years? Right? So this helps you identify what you like, what you don't like, or what you're good at, or, or vice versa. Or maybe you want to start your own firm. You know, or take a principal spot or, or whatever it is, in which case you probably should know a little bit about all of this, right? So you don't hurt somebody. It's probably a good idea. Um, whatever it is, really try to make, make the most of it. For me, at the end of the day, going back to that bullet point about increased value, you know, I was relatively young in my career and I couldn't just take on clients and get commissions and bring in all this money now that I had a license. But one of the things I did is I went to our project <coughs> managers. We had about five to seven at any given time. And they did the projects literally from A to Z. They managed the whole thing. And I said, look, I can take care of all this construction stuff for you. I can do all the CA work, sign the pay apps, do the punch list, you know, go to the construction meetings. I can take all that off your plate for you. And that's what started to happen. And from that, it kind of freed up my project managers to do a little bit more marketing, a little bit more pre-design, and a little bit more client hand-holding, and things like that that would bring in new projects and new dollars and, and new money. So that's how I kind of try to create value um, early on through, through this process. <coughs> yes? Uh, you realize in 5600 that the hours is told that you have to have, isn't there a difference of the period hours between the five-year program and the six-year program? Is there a difference in hours based on your education? Is that what you're asking? Right. Based on what degree you're in? Right. No, absolutely not. Um, if you are, you're eligible literally as soon as, previously when you enrolled in this program, that's actually been modified recently too when you graduated high school. So the, the I guess the distance or the length to 5600 is the same regardless of degree program. Maybe you're referring to a previous Florida regulation that allowed you to get licensed earlier with a, with a master's, which was a previous requirement few years back, maybe that's what you're referencing. You know, it, it basically, it used to be that it, with a master's, you basically cut out a year. You could put your kid licensure for two years versus with your bachelor, it would be for three years. Okay, a couple things on that. Um, there is an opportunity, it's called with advanced degrees, that give you a lump sum of 930 hours towards IDP. By advanced degrees, we mean degrees beyond your professional degree. So that would be a degree after your five-year DR or after your two- or three-year MR. So your professional degree comes first, and then you can get another degree that earns credit towards IDP. Okay? You don't just get credit for the two- or three-year master's. Okay, if that's your first professional degree, that doesn't help you get credit here. Is that what you're referring to, perhaps? Uh, a few years ago, the yeah. CFR would allow you to supplement that last year if you have a master's degree. Yes. That was only the CFR. To get your in-card certificate, you still have to go the full three years to get to get the rest of the in the neighborhood state. Yeah, that's now gone as well. Yeah. So that's a separate issue. What he's referring to there is a few years ago, if you had a master's, you actually had to do, was it one year or two years? Two years. Two years of IDP, then you were good to go and you can get a license. That's no longer the case. Okay. Florida now abides by all the same kind of uniform rules as most of the other states. So I'm going to touch on that advanced degree issue again in a few slides, okay, regarding that, that six month lump sum out. If anybody has questions about what we just talked about, there's kind of some complex issues there, just catch me afterwards and we'll go into it in more detail.
Okay, so as you guys are earning hours, you earn them in experience settings, which are essentially where you work and who you work for. Okay, there's three of them A, O, and S. A is your practice of architecture, that's your standard architecture firm. Okay, most of you guys will probably do your entire IDP in this setting, which is perfect. Okay. <coughs> It's also good because there's actually a minimum in this setting. You actually have to have at least a year in an architecture firm. But all of your other hours, if you happen to work in other places, can come from other places. And that's what O and S are for. O includes working for an architect in a non-architecture capacity. It includes working for a foreign architect, a landscape architect, or an engineer. Okay. S includes a whole bunch of stuff. It's kind of like a catch-all. Includes things outside of your office that you might be doing, as well as something called designer construction related experience, which doesn't have any requirements for the supervisor at all. As long as it's designer construction related work, it counts. I'm going to go into S in a little bit more detail in a second, but the point I want you to take away from this slide is that if you, just because you might not be working in an architecture firm, you know, tried and true, that doesn't have to take you off of your path it still can count towards IDP and you can still move forward, okay? And chances are, if you find yourself here or here, that might be a great foundation to kind of broaden your skill set and maybe, you know, inform your, your years as an architect. So keep that in mind. It's just not working at an architecture firm. Everything else related counts as well. Two things real quick before we get into supplemental experience. There's a supervisor and there's a mentor, okay? And people tend to blend these or confuse these terms a little bit, so I want to make it crystal clear for you guys before you walk out. The supervisor is your boss at your job, at your employment. Okay, they kind of direct your workflow, they know what you're doing on a daily basis, um, and they're going to actually approve your IDP hours from your employment. Okay? Your mentor is an optional career advisor. It's somebody you can go to um, you know, maybe once every six months, maybe once a year, and kind of tell them you know, your challenges or what your two-year plan is or what you're thinking about. Again, optional. You could have one, you could have four, or you could have none. Okay? The point here is that this was set up to try to give you a broader perspective on the profession and just somebody that you can actually go to to, to talk with outside of your day-to-day -day, you know, work, work. They can actually approve, however, some of the supplemental experience we're going to talk about in a second which for the most part are things outside of your job that you might be doing. So again, your boss at your job, and then a career advisor that can approve things outside of, of your working environment. Okay, so here's supplemental experience. Lots of things up here that you can do. I'm just going to touch on a few of them. Um, in our IDP guidelines, there's literally a page for each one of these. Um, so if something strikes your ear and you want to go back and check on it, by all means, um, you know, check out the guidelines. It tells you how much credit you can earn, who needs to approve it, and what you need to actually do to, to earn the hours. Core hours, are, these are opportunities under core hours over here, and then opportunities for elective hours here. Okay. Over here, designer construction management related employment. That's anything related to designer construction. So interior design, work at a developer, a planner, anything like that. That's your catch-all. Okay, that's where everything else kind of, kind of comes into play. You'll see leadership and service up here. Leadership and service is the only one up here that's actually required. Okay, it's actually one of those 17 areas I talked about a few slides back. There's an 80-hour leadership and service requirement. Okay? Many of you guys are probably doing this stuff right now with AIS or Freedom by Design or you know, whatever it is around campus. And it's community service. It doesn't have to be related to architecture. It can be organizing a charity 5K. It could be volunteering at a homeless shelter, anything like that. And it's, it's not just service. It's leadership as well. So if you're an AIS officer um, or if you go to a NOMA conference or something like that, whatever it is, that counts. Okay? Some additional things, design competitions. If you're doing a competition on your own time, um, outside of your firm or outside of school, that counts as well. So whatever you're doing, you know, whether it's programming or construction documents or schematic design, that counts. There's something called the Emerging Professionals Companion. It's a free online workbook with activities in every single one of those areas I talked about earlier. Bidding, um, programming, site analysis, whatever it is that you're having trouble getting, this EPC has something for you. 
again, it's free, it's online, you do it on your own time. Each activity earns eight hours of credit, whether it takes you eight minutes or, or 18 hours. Um, I usually like to pause here for a second and talk about something called the zero barrier. And what I mean by that is, sometimes with IDP, it's tough to get hours in certain areas if you don't have any hours in that area. Let's take bidding and contract negotiation, for instance. That's a particularly tough area to get hours in. And sometimes it's hard to get out onto a bid opening or something if you've never done that type of work before. Well, with the EPC, you can go online and you can do these on your own time. You can rack up 8, 16, 24 hours. And then you can go back to your supervisor and say, hey, I did some activities. I did this. I did that. Maybe it leads to a conversation. Maybe it leads to you know, an invite to a bid opening the following month. And you start to get plugged into more and more things. For me, that's kind of exactly what happened. I started to get some hours in CA. And it started to snowball into more and more and more CA hours. So I think sometimes, again, just breaking that zero barrier can really help you amass more and more hours. This NCAR Professional Conduct Monograph, this is a free PDF. It's in every single one of your records once you sign up and you pay that fee. It's sitting there waiting for you. You click on the PDF, and there's a link to a quiz. Once you pass the quiz, it's 16 hours of uh, business operations. Okay. Which can be tough to get depending upon you know, what kind of firm you're in. Also, don't tell anybody I told you, but I think you can quiz as many times you want. So chances are you're going to pass, right? <laughs> most, most of you. Um, let's see what else. Site visit with Metro at the bottom. Any chance you have to be out on site with an architect. Um, if it's an AIS hard hat tour, an AIA hard hat tour, maybe a bunch of firms get together and go tour somebody's project. Um, sometimes it's tough to get those observation hours if your firm isn't you know, in the middle of building something. So um, if you can team up with somebody else, any chance you have to get on site, out on site with an architect, that counts. All right, teaching your research up here. So if you're a TA or a GA or something like that or whatever it is, uh, that counts as well. Construction work counts, so framing, roofing, grading, all that. And then advanced degrees. And I'll pause here again for a second to kind of clarify that advanced degree issue. Okay. This advanced degree opportunity under elective hours gives you 930 hours, that's a lump sum of about six months, if you earn an advanced degree beyond your first professional degree. Okay. So again, that's a degree beyond your either your five-year BR or your two or three-year MR. The two or three-year MR in and of itself does not earn that, that advanced degree credit. Okay. That's your professional degree that meets your education requirements. AIA Continuing Education, these are seminars, conferences, things like that, lunch and learns. Uh, at the firm I used to work for, we used to have lunch and learns every Tuesday, Thursday. Okay, vendors would come in, talk about concrete, storefront, whatever it was, buy us lunch, and we'd sit there and listen. And, and every single one of those hours is an hour of IDP. People tend to not sign up for these, or they go to them and they don't put in their hours because they just don't think it adds up to enough. <coughs> I tell you, by the time I was done, I think I had 60 or 70 of these hours, okay? And I was just going for the free lunch, literally. <laughs> um, you know, but it adds up. Now, chances are I, I probably learned something along the way. So as you guys start to go to conferences and, and lunch and learns and whatnot, definitely record that stuff, because it's going to start to build up. You'd be surprised like the day does. Um, you'll see the EPC up here as well. And you'll see the lead AP. That's the last one I want to touch on. Hopefully you guys are familiar a little bit with LEAD. Uh, they have a GA test first, the LEAD Green Associate. That's kind of a prerequisite exam. After you take that, you, are in the, you can move up to the AP exam. That's this. If you take that AP and earn it, that earns some hours towards IEP as well. Okay? Now, I'm a huge fan of credentials. Okay? I have like 50 letters after my name, and I plan on getting more, literally. Um, I think, personally, that we live in a highly competitive environment um, I could be fired tomorrow, so I would need to send out resumes tomorrow. I don't think that credentials are going to get me a job, per se, but they might get me an interview. And they might make me stand out a little bit in comparison to other folks. So if you can pick up you know, a credential or two along the way, you'll see some over here, too. I mean, that's just you know, the more the merrier, kind of, sort of. Along the way to your license, you get IDP hours for it, and it boosts your resume. So, yes, ma'am? Um, with the lead, because there are so many different sections, do mm -hmm. you get hours for each? Good question. The question was about the lead AP and 
if you're familiar with it at all, there's actually several different specialties within the AP. There's lead AP for homes, shell, and new construction, all kinds of stuff. It's only once, so it's for your first AP. And it's a lump sum 40 hours, uh, which you know is meant to incorporate the study you've done to earn that credential. Yes? Who actually um, approves these supplemental hours? Good question. Like supervisor or? Sure. So uh, the question was about approving these supplemental hours and who actually does it. And in most cases, it varies depending on which option it is. For some of the, the self-designated ones, like design competitions or the EPC, it's actually a mentor, which is any licensed architect, anybody. It could be a colleague, it could be a past professor, it could be somebody you work with at your firm, whatever it is. Some of the other ones are kind of automatic. This professional conduct monograph, once you pass that quiz, it automatically goes into your, your record. With AIA, you send us a transcript from the AIA, which documents all of your sessions. That puts it into your record automatically. The AP, there's a score report. You just send it to us, and we upload your hours automatically. In our IDP guidelines, there's literally a page for each one of these that tells you who needs to approve it and how that process works. So, all right, again, it's a lot for one slide, so we'll move on. Yes, I'm uh, sorry, it's dark. Like for, um, you had a minimum and maximum amount of hours that you didn't have for the supplement, so how many hours are you able to? Good question. Yeah, so all of these kind of have their own minimums and maximums, so to speak. Um, so that, again, that's, that's why I refer you to those guidelines. Just as a quick sampling to kind of show you how different it is, up here, this design construction related employment, that's 930 hours, that's six months, okay? Some of these down here, design competitions, EPC, it's up to 40 hours per area. So 40 hours in site design, 40 hours in, in site analysis, 40 hours in codes. Um, here with Lead AP, we talked about it being just a 40 hour lump sum. So there is some variation among, among these. So if you see something that you're interested, I would check it out for sure. Okay. I think I see you. Okay. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Under the EPC guidelines, the fine print at the bottom it says you cannot receive credit for those if you execute them in an academic setting. Why? So the question was, I assume you all heard that. I think it's worth slide. <laughs> so in this case, it, they don't earn credit for academic, for when you perform them in an academic setting, because technically that work then goes towards your education requirement. So it's part of your class, which is part of your degree, which is part of the education requirement, which was that first section I put up. And the intent there originally, and I'll tell you why I say originally here in a second, is that we wanted to separate all the three pieces and parts, education, experience, and exam, and not allow double dipping between the different elements. That philosophy is actually now changing significantly, particularly with the fact that you guys can begin IDP now as soon as you, you know, graduate high school. Um, some of the other opportunities you can actually do concurrently with school so that is one that we're actually going to look at closely in the coming year to try and revise that a little bit. Because you're right, it doesn't completely make sense in today's environment. But that was the original, original intent and philosophy. All right. So let's talk about reporting the hours a little bit. There is a reporting requirement or a timeline. Um, and essentially what it says is that if you go online today, you can report hours eight months back from today. If you go online tomorrow, you can go eight months back from tomorrow. Okay, so what are we, we're in November. So if any of you have summer experience that you haven't put into the system yet, definitely look into signing up for a record and, and getting those hours in. Because sooner rather than later, they're gonna start to expire, okay? The intent here is that you know where you are in the process and your supervisor knows where you are in the process and that you have a back and forth dialogue, you know, rather frequently, okay? So once every eight months, hopefully that's not too burdensome. Here's the reporting system. It's like an online timesheet. You can go online every Friday and put in your hours and just save them. And then maybe every few months you submit them to your supervisor. Okay. I have a quick question about that. Yeah. If your supervisor, your man, in this case, supervisor, like I supervise a certain people, mm -hmm. if I say that the employee did those hours and experiences, if they don't report in eight months, they still do? Correct. It, the system won't even let you go in and put in hours that are part of eight months back. Correct. So I put this up here. I, I don't have time to go into all the details of how it works, but I want to make sure you've seen it before and it looks familiar. Um, we have a little widget here that actually allows you to put in hours 
per day, so you can actually go in and just update daily. This is going to be an iPhone app in a couple months, so hopefully that makes it a little bit easier once you guys get started. We have guidelines, we have emails, we have IDP emus that come out all the time. Um, if you don't get enough email, let me know. I can help with that. I'll give you more. Um, with that said, I'm going to send around a sign-in sheet. We still have the ARE to cover, but I want to make sure you guys get a chance to fill this out. Just put in your email and, and let us know where you stand, and, and we can get you some more information if you, if you like it. All right, so that's it for IDP for right now. We're going to move on and to the ARE. Any, any last questions before we... Is there more than one of those sign-in sheets? There is, yeah. Of course. Good. Yes, ma'am. Um, you said that anybody can start at IDP after high school. What yes. happens if they don't pursue a professional degree? What happens to those hours? So, good question. There, there's kind of a, a couple things I want to mention with that. So, a couple changes happened to IDP recently. Um, and the first was with eligibility dates. Um, for those of you who have started, you, you may have looked into the fact that you can't start until you've either enrolled in a program, professional or pre professional or started working in an architecture firm. Those were kind of your thresholds. That's now been scrapped, and all the forms associated with that have been scrapped. And as soon as you graduate high school, you're good to go with IEP. Okay. Now, the question, the follow-up part of that is, well, what happens if you never earn a professional degree and you never go that route? Well, there's twofold. One, maybe you just don't get a license and it's not the career you, you pursue, and you, know, you pay the $100 up front and you never pay again, and it you know, just fizzles away, and that's okay. Um, and then the second is, there actually are some states that don't require a NAB degree. Okay, there's about 15 of them. Okay, so you can earn a license with either a pre-professional degree, or in some cases, a high school degree plus X number of years of education. Okay, that option does exist in about 15 states. The caveat to that, especially for those of you in the four-year program, is that if you were to go and earn a license in one of those states, you're kind of locked in to that state and that state only. Your ability to move and be mobile between the states is pretty much removed. So, so that's the that's the big picture there. Okay. All right. Let's get into the fun stuff. The exam. That's a joke too. Uh, as far as I can tell, again, I've been doing this a little over five years. Um, everybody loves exams. People love seven section exams even more. From from all I can tell. So let's take a look at it. <laughs> so here it is, seven sections, okay, you take them in whatever order you want and whatever timeline you want, okay? A couple things to think about for you guys, here in Florida, as soon as you graduate with that NAB accredited degree, whether it's the two or three year MR or that five year BR, you're eligible to take this exam, okay? So a lot of you might take it as soon as you graduate, okay? It, in my personal philosophy, in my opinion, I think it's better to take it closer to school simply because you're used to studying, you're used to tests, you're used to that academic kind of mindset. For whatever reason, as people start to get farther and farther away from school, they see this test as kind of more and more of an unknown, and more and more of a foreign entity, so to speak. Um, and we're actually starting to see data that backs that the pass rates for people closer to school are actually higher than the people who wait longer. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is that if you fail a particular division, they're pass-fail, each one of them. If you fail a particular division, you have to wait six months before you take that particular division again. So if you fail building design and construction, you have to wait six months before you take <coughs> building design and construction again. Okay? But you can take all the others while that six months is, is elapsed. Okay? Now, whatever order you take them in is up to you. Everybody wants to know what the best order is. There, there isn't a best order. Okay, if we all came back 10 years from now, and we'd have 30 different permutations of the best way through this test. I mean, it's just, it's very personal. It's up to your strengths and your preferences and your philosophy on, on testing. But timeline-wise, a test a week, a test a month. Um, you know, whatever you feel is appropriate, test every few months. Seven tests, seven days. That'd be a sweet party, all right? If anybody does that and passes, please send me an email because I'm going to write an article about it. <laughs> I'll make you famous in the end part um, No, in all seriousness, uh, again, it, it's it's very proactive, just like the IDP, and that's why we emphasize that, that proaction at the beginning. Yes, sir. What class did you for the right one? Uh, a buddy of mine at the firm I used to work for, he literally sat behind me back to back. Uh, he passed it in about a month and a half. 
probably the fastest I've heard. Now, some of the folks in the room, some of the professors maybe took it back in the day when it actually used to be offered just once a year and it was four and a half days maybe, maybe three and a half. Um, it so was, it was four, four days and then it was another day. And six months later, there was a 12 hour class. Oh, so there you go. December. 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 So, in this, in, in this format, that's about as fast as I've heard. Um, but I'm sure that people, one of the uh, philosophies of a principal I used to work with, his philosophy was to not study for anything because he wanted to wait to find out what he didn't know. So he took them all cold, <laughs> see how things lie, and then he knew where he had to spend his time. Now, there are financial risks associated with that. We'll get to it in a second. Yeah. So we'll get to that in a second. But lots of different ways to approach it. There really are. Um, so you really kind of have to look at your strategy and your approach. And we'll get to studying in a second. I got, I got some tips on that. Um, but let's talk more about the actual test. Okay. It's got multiple choice questions. Those are the numbers you see up here. And then graphic vignettes, which are the titles kind of underneath each one. Multiple choice are pretty much like anything you've seen before. They also include, though, fill in the blank, which are quantitative only, just numbers, so you don't, won't be subjective. And uh, check all that apply. So we'll give you eight different options when you check maybe four, whatever it is. The graphic vignettes are probably unlike anything you've ever seen before. There's a specific software. You can download it from our website. You can practice it as much as you want before you go in. It's not CAD-based, and it's not BIM-based, and it's very unintuitive compared to what you've been working on in your previous you know, work. So you have to practice it up front, okay? If you give it a week, maybe, of just practicing it a little bit every night, I guarantee you're going to pick it up pretty quickly, okay? These vignettes, they give you a program, and they give you a code, and they say, do this like this, and that's what you got to do, okay? Keep in mind as you're taking it, this is a computer-graded exam. Nobody's checking it to make sure you know you've done all the things that merit a design award. Okay, we're just checking competency. Can you follow a program according to a code? Just do that, and you're going to be just fine. Also, with the software, if you know it well enough, you get in there. I guarantee you, you can draft up a whole design in five to ten minutes. We're going to give you seventy-five or ninety minutes, but that allows you to read the program, read the code, sketch some things up, draft it up. And if you get to the end and you realize you misread something or you did something wrong, if you know it well enough, you can literally erase the whole thing and redraft it in five minutes. So don't throw your hands up at five minutes left and say, I'll just take it again in six months. Okay? Erase it and draft it up again real quick. I guarantee you can do it if you know the software well enough. And frankly, with the software, there's only so much you can do, only so many actions you can take, only, only so many things you can bring in. All right? Real quickly on timeline, <clears throat> with the IDP, we mentioned you can, you can take as long as you want, as, you, as long as you report those hours every, every eight months. With the ARE, it's a little bit different. There's a rolling clock. It's a five-year rolling clock, and it starts on the day you pass your first exam, and you have five years from that point to take all the remaining exams. At the end of that five years, only the exam that's five years old drops off, and the clock rolls to the next past exam, and you have five years from that point. Okay. Now, five years gives you the chance to take each test ten times. That's a lot of times. Okay, if you're still taking it at that point, keep going, because you're obviously clearly invested in this process. <laughs> <laughs> and you've got more, <laughs> more funds than I do. Um, also, somebody's going to hire you for something, because you have some clear and testing endurance that most people don't have. So call Kaplan, call Kristen Renew, call somebody else. Call for help. Um, all right, so fees. Um, not a lot of ways I can sugarcoat this, but I will give you some perspectives. Okay, it's two hundred and ten dollars per division, and one pass through is fourteen seven. Right. So I'll tell you mine first, and then, then I'll give you another one. Um, when I finished this test up, I actually served on an, an ARE committee for NCAR, because I, I it had nothing to do with my time and wanted to take more tests. Apparently, so I went in and I went into this ARE committee and. They were asking me some questions about my feedback because I had recently taken it. And they said, you know, Nick, what if it were 15 divisions? What if it were 20 divisions? What, what would you think? And I said, look, I, I don't care if it's 25 divisions. I don't care what it costs. I don't care how many there are. I'm going to budget my time and I'm going to budget my money to make that happen because I want that competitive advantage. I want that credential. It's what I need. 
So for me, it didn't really matter. I was going to kind of budget it out and make it happen. The other perspective is there's a guy that I work with at NCAR. He's on the administrative side. Not an architect, uh, but he went to George Washington University. It's in downtown DC. It's one of the nation's most expensive schools. And he talks about how all of his money came from a scholarship and all of his clothes came from a scholarship. And so he talks about how when he graduated, all he had were jerseys and shorts and sweats from his time on the baseball team at GW. It's literally all he had. He goes, I have one suit that I use for an interview at different jobs. And he got a job at a law firm. He goes, I had to be there you know, in a couple weeks. He goes, I literally went to Macy's on a weekend and dropped over $2,000 on shoes, suits, shirts, ties, you know, all that stuff, just so I could show up to work you know, that following Monday. It's just what he needed to do to kind of you know, make that job happen. And so this is kind of the same thing. If you want that project architect position, if you want that principal spot, if you want to have your own firm, then that's kind of, kind of the very thing. Okay. Also, if it's, any, if it's any help, we do have third-party vouchers. So you can have other people pay for this. The holidays are coming up. You know, Valentine's Day is coming up. I don't think anything says I love you. <laughs> kind of like a test, yeah. I think it's very romantic. <laughs> yeah, yeah, let me know if you find her. <laughs> All right, so some study tips. Now, a lot of these may seem really basic and, and kind of an overview type thing, but I've been doing this again for five years, and I've talked to people over and over again who don't pay attention to any of it. So I'm going to go over there and with you. The first is to stick to a plan. You've got to put it on your calendar. There is never a good time to take a seven section test, ever in your life. It's, the calendar's never gonna open up for seven you know, moments for you to take a test and study for it, okay? People are always telling me about either something in their personal life or their professional life that they're waiting to happen before they begin to study and take the test. It's a project at work, it's you know, getting married, having a kid, whatever it is, something like that. The thing is that hopefully at work there's another project after that, otherwise you don't have a job, right? <laughs> Hopefully, in your personal life, there's something beyond whatever that, that threshold is that you're waiting for, right? So, again, there's never a good time. So you've got to put it on a calendar. You've just got to make it, make it happen, okay? NCARB has some study materials. They're free. You can download them from our website. They're not comprehensive. They're not going to get you completely through the exam. People always ask me what the best study materials are, and my response is always the free ones. And what I mean by that is anything your firm has, you know, Buried in the library, anything your AIA chapter has. Um, I think I had a session at AIA Tallahassee last night. They have some, some materials here in Tallahassee. Um, whatever it is, usually the AIA component has free materials you can check out. Use those materials, okay? Because something else to consider, don't overstudy slash choose your study materials wisely. I used to work with a guy who had a stack of stuff on his desk, literally like this high, of things he was going to study for the exam. That was over five years ago. He has yet to take a test. He clearly has other issues in his life. <laughs> I realize that now. But I think, uh, uh, looking back on it, I think that that stack is part of it at the beginning. It's too daunting. You know, you never want to launch it. It never, never looks palatable. And even if you did, by the time you got to the bottom of the stack, you'd forget what was in the top. So just pick one or two study guides and one or two reference materials because you only have to pass. Okay, not necessarily get an A. So don't over-design this, okay? You gotta jump in eventually and, and take it. Um, I think sometimes the best prep is just taking an exam. I think somebody who's taken one and studied seven hours for the next one is exponentially more prepared than somebody who has studied 17 hours for that same exam. I think just knowing you know, how the questions come out, what they look like, how they read, is, is hugely valuable. There's this time money dilemma we already touched on. Some people have a lot of time and no money. Some people have a lot of no, a lot of money and no time. Some people have none of none. none. <laughs> I don't have an answer here, but I can guarantee you that everybody in the world is there in some fashion. Okay, so you got to figure it out. And at the end of the day, look, I've spoken to hundreds, if not over a thousand, people who've taken this and passed this test. Okay, and there's one common denominator among every single person who's passed this test. Every single person, at some point, they started the exam. Now, that seems like a, a rather captain obvious moment, right? But I talk to people, the same people, year after year after year at the same conferences, who are still waiting to start. 
They're waiting for that thing in their life to happen. I'm going to do it this year. I'm going to do it this year. I'm going to do it this year. They never get to start it. It's a daunting task. It's seven tests. It's a lot of studying. You know, there's financial implications. But you got to start because if you don't start, you, you can't ever finish. Okay? All right. We have ARI guidelines as well. We have e-news. There's a lot of changes to this coming up in 2016. This chain test is changing formats a little bit. Uh, the graphics, the graphics uh, part of the test are, is changing significantly. The software is going away. We're going to do a little bit of a different format. But that is 2016. For those of you who are in your at the end of your B arc right now, or are in the two or three year M arc, the plan is not to wait until 2016. Okay, that is not the strategy. I would highly recommend finishing it before that because there is a certain amount of institutional knowledge out there about the existing test, meaning online and within your firms and things like that. The content is still a content, right? A brick is still a brick. Hurricanes still work the same way, but things do change and Test scores do tend to drop a little bit when we change formats. So keep that in mind as you guys start to approach that 2016 date. That strategy is not to wait for that. If you get a chance to knock it out before then, I would highly recommend it. Yes, sir. For my particular class, if you're going to be graduating in the spring of 2015, then I assume if we take if we start taking the test then, we'll be grandfathered in for the, the current version. Yeah, good question. Um, the transition details for that new test are going to come out next summer, which is summer of 2014. So you'll know at that point how it will transition from the old test to the new test and how folks who start in the current one will transition to the new one, if at all. We're not exactly sure how that's working currently. We're, we're investigating that. But next summer is when we hope to solidify that and pin it down. So you'll have a year and a half from that point to kind of strategize and, and know what the repercussions are. So the summer of 2014? The summer of 2014 will announce the transition, yes. And then 2016 is when the actual change will happen. Yeah, good questions for those doing that one. Okay. Um, last thing I want to touch on briefly is mobility. How are we doing on time? Um, and that's something called the NCARB certificate. Most of you guys are going to earn your license here in Florida. Well, <laughs> you may have clients or you may yourself move to another state and need other licenses. That's what the NCARB certificate allows for. It facilitates licenses in other jurisdictions really quickly and easily. Okay? Uh, for me, I earned my first license here in Florida. I needed one in Virginia. I filled out a two-page application. Um, NCARB sent my record. I had to pay a fee for that. But once they did, two weeks later, I had my license from the state of Virginia. It was quick and easy. Okay, two weeks. And that's the value of this thing called the NCARB certificate. Okay? So let's talk a little bit about what you need to actually earn this thing. Degree, do you have that NAV accredited degree? Again, five year B arc or two or three year M arc. If you have that, you're good to go. Did you do IEP? Did you take the ARE? And do you have a license? That's it. Okay. There's no extra hurdle to jump through or, or requirement that you have to complete. Okay. If you have those things, you're good to go. Okay. You can use NCARB after your name if you get it. That's five letters. Extend your business card. <laughs> Whatever it takes. So, as we kind of wrap up, <laughs> bring it all about. Um, I talked at the beginning about being proactive. And as hopefully you saw throughout IDP, a lot of the strategies are kind of on you and how you approach it and how well you work with your supervisor. Uh, same with the ARE, it's about how you schedule it, how you break out your time, budget, you know, money and time. And so everything's about just kind of taking that leap because you can't ever, you know, fly, so to speak, if you don't have a job. Lots of stuff on our website. If you need guidelines or webcasts or whatever it is, uh, they're there. All over social media, of course. Um, and we're kind of taking we're kind of taking questions throughout, but I do want to touch on one thing about our customer service real quick. Um, we have a staff uh, back in our office in Washington. Um, there's about 30 or 40 folks. They're available at 8:30 to 5:30 Monday through Friday. Okay. People run into me all the time. They're like, oh, you know, I've had this issue for six months now, and I've, I've never had it resolved. Well, problems never figure themselves out, okay? So just call us if something looks a little strange, if the system isn't working right, if you're not sure what the next step is, if you just need some perspective, uh, whatever it is, call us, because we can't fix it unless we know about it. And in a lot of cases, especially with the system and paperwork, we can get cleared up pretty easily, and chances are we've seen it, you know, 100 times before. Um, the other caveat is that these folks who are working our customer service, they're not architecture graduates, they're not architects, 
So a lot of times they don't know exactly what you guys are going through. We have about 10 folks on staff at NCARB who are architects. If you get into a situation where you need more clarification, you want to speak to one of us who, who've been there before, you know, just let them know. Ask, tell them that you'd like to speak to an architect. And you know, We're not as responsive as they are. We're not manning the phones. But we can definitely get back to you and, and maybe find a little more perspective for you. So with that, any, any final questions? Yeah, yeah, please. Uh, we have one question here. I'm just going to probably do a couple of these one person. Let me ask first. Yeah. Um, quick thank you to uh, uh, Professor Johnson and Professor Alfano for helping to communicate both together and also Terry that she is from NIA inviting me back to Martin couldn't make a couple of trips. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, a couple things. As part of our accreditation report, we need to document certain things. So more and more, you'll see us asking you guys to fill out complete surveys uh, at different events. Uh, those of you who were here right at the start uh, when we filled out the survey, you can do it on your phone. I'm going to ask everyone else to do it kind of right now before you take off, and we can do it on your phone. So if you go to the school website, www.fanu.edu backslash architecture, okay? you can go to that on your phone, www.fanu.edu backslash architecture. On the bottom left, where there are a series of about five or six orange buttons, you'll see one called survey, and there's seven simple questions. Okay. In it, you answer the seven questions, and also we'll ask you to, for your name to confirm your kind of verify your architect who you're filling it out, not the robot. And that will also be kind of submitted as a report to uh, uh, Professor Johnson. Another thing, a reminder, there's a series of incentive sheets that are floating around, about three of them. Can, can, where are the sheets right now? One, two, three. So if you haven't signed it, make sure you sign the sheet and uh, they can take it back. Yep. And uh, Professor Johnson will be asking for a copy also. Okay. So if you go to www.fanu.edu backslash architecture on the bottom left, you'll see a button called survey. And if you go to the button called survey, it'll pull up about six or seven questions. Okay. The other thing is, in addition to the calls into the website, the phone number is definitely identified. Mm -hmm. Professor Alfano, those of you who haven't had him, is the school's IDP coordinator. He goes to the workshops every year. Um, so he knows, don't ask me, and he goes and gets the updates each year. So if you have a point person here in the school, if you haven't had him, you can ask the questions, okay? Um, last thing I just want to ask while I'm pulling up. Ask someone in the back to introduce himself. We have an alumni guest today. Uh, my name is DJ Scott. I'm an architect at MLD Architects here in Tallahassee. Um, I'm the outgoing associate director at large for this, uh, AIA Florida and the incoming vice president at AIA Florida. I'm also a Florida a and alumni. Um, you guys, if you, if you have any questions regarding um, the IDP process or anything like that, I, I've just come through it. I'm all, I've only been licensed a year and a couple of months. So not this past September, but the September before that. So um, I've just come through the ARA process and uh, completed IDP. And uh, so if you have any questions regarding that, any questions about uh, why I'm a member of AIA, uh, what AIA does for you or anything like that, please do not hesitate to call me. I have got my contact uh, information. Jamie's got my contact information because she's in my office. Uh, Andrew's got my contact information. If you if you need a question answered, I'm I'm here. I'll, I'll be more than happy to help you guys out. Jamie, what does membership in the AIA associate membership cost? An associate membership, I believe. Well, here's the thing. Your first year uh, out of college, as soon as you graduate, your first year is free. All right. That what that does is that gets you into the system, into the into the uh, association, and kind of lets you learn a little bit about what we do and, and how we do it. Um, your membership costs, if I'm not mistaken, now it's less than I believe it's around two hundred dollars. And uh, but you know, and you're saying, well, I'm an associate. I don't have really have a big budget. Why in the world would I do that? Um, to me, my, the elevator speech that I always give is, you know, what, what AI does is it is the voice of our profession. Um, it, it is the, the one entity that speaks for you basically at the legislative level. 
Um, that, that's the most important thing that, I, that, that AIA does for me. Um, you know, they do, they do things like compile all your continuing education credits and, and things like that, and, that, and that's all well and good. Um, and, which you, and, and you need it a lot. I mean, that, that's very, very convenient. But what, for me, the most important thing is that AIA is a collaborative voice that protects my profession, protects any other profession either trying to erode what, what we do for a living, um, and keeps me with the responsibility to be the, the, the leader in the project development. So, um, you know, I don't know how, how, how much you guys know or not, but there, there's engineers, there's interior designers, there's, there's a bunch of other professions that like to take a little bite of what we do on a yearly basis. And the more and more that we can kind of stave off that bite, the better, I mean, the, the, the better we are to, to be more valuable. You know, eventually, if we just give up, give up, give up, give up, what does an architect, I mean, engineers do all that, you know, or interior designers can do that. You know, so, so the architects become less and less relevant. JJ, I believe there is an associate membership in the AIA Tallahassee only, which is $40 or something like that. There, it, our local news, it, that 200 is also, uh, don't get me wrong, the, the 200 is split between a national, state, and local due. So there is a local dues um, that's like, local, it is like. Paying the local dues allows you to go to AIA meetings, get notices of those meetings, and you get one hour credit each time you go. Right, yeah. right. And and the, the CEUs, a lot of times, um, can go toward, like Nick was saying, it can go toward IDP credit. Um, and you're there to network as well. You can go to other meetings, you can sit there and network with almost every architect in the city. Um, which is great when you're looking for an internship. So again, uh, Nick provided the web link. Wes Alfano is here uh, for other points of questions. But again, while Nick's here, any other questions? Sure. Uh, yeah. question. um, regarding that three hundred and fifty dollars fee to be put to set up a record with the card um, for students who have yet to graduate, and then within six months after, we can pay. Hundred dollars and basically open up that record until we take the test, and when we take the test, we pay the two fifty. Is that window between the one hundred dollars and the test um, indefinite? As of now, yeah. There's, there's no time on. Question for those of you who didn't hear, maybe um, the the pay structure for for students it's one hundred dollars up front, two fifty whenever you're ready to take the test. The difference when how long it takes you to get from the one hundred to two hundred. Right now, the way we currently have a structure can be indefinite. So um, there's you know, no requirement that you take the test within a certain period of time. Good question. You know, a lot of, a lot of I, I hear that $100 is a big amount of money. How much do you pay for your shoes? more <laughs> 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 So it's all, it's all. Anything else? Uh, all right. Thank you. So I work for Architect. Does he need to do anything to help me with the IDD process? Or sure. You know? Yeah, good question. So in terms of the approval process, particularly with an architect or with anybody, frankly, once you put in your hours into the system, you have a chance to then submit it to your supervisor. That submittal process, you simply put in their name and their email address, and it sends an electronic notification to your supervisor. Hey, you know, John has sent you hours. Please approve them at your at you know, your convenience. The first time they get that, there'll be a link to create a little profile of themselves. After that, it's really quick and easy each time. There's actually, I think, a hyperlink to just approve instantly, I believe. So it should be quick and easy. You post it, and you know, you send it right to your supervisor, and you know, it, it's all online, it's really quick, you know, not asking a lot. How about, uh, Andy's had a really good question. Yeah. What about if you're working for a foreign architect? Yeah, great question. Do they, can they be a supervisor as well? Yeah, so there are two scenarios in which working abroad qualifies, okay? The first is working with a foreign architect. If that's the case, so let's say you're in London and you're working underneath an architect license in the UK. That would fall under that O setting, that other work settings. And it allows hours in all the different areas, except it's capped at a year. Okay. 
If you work abroad, but for a U.S. architect, so maybe you're in a Hong Kong office and your supervisor is a U.S. architect, in that case, you can complete the entire IDP abroad. That's work setting A, and you're good to go. We also have a couple ARE test centers abroad. So now you could technically finish your degree here, go work abroad, and take the test abroad, and complete the whole thing, never coming back to the United States. So two options, and it depends on your supervisor. Foreign supervisor is O, U.S. supervisor is A. Good question. You got oh, yeah. the eligibility forms. Yeah, and don't. And then my comment is, do not. The eligibility form must be submitted by the school to confirm you have a math degree. Who do you submit your eligibility form to? Anyone know? Or who else? Well, well, let me save you. Should I say? Well, yeah. Nobody anymore. Yeah. yeah. As of at least. Literally, mid-September, our board voted to do away with those forms okay. completely. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So, let me, let me clarify and start from the beginning so all of you who are shaking your heads can be sure and those of you who don't know what we're talking about can understand. Um, <laughs> there used to be an eligibility date, meaning that we had to confirm when you enrolled here at FAMU, and there were forms associated with it. And you would have to take your form over to Mike, he would sign it, or the uh, chair of the department would sign it, and then they would send it to us. It was kind of a bureaucratic nightmare. That is now gone. And that literally happened as of mid-September, our board voted on it. And you're going to see correspondence in the next couple weeks. It's going to officially go online December 16th. But it, you might as well just get rid of them now and call it a day. Um, we're never going to need them. So it's all done. So if you see those forms, if you turn them in before, just don't worry about it. It's all gone. Yes, ma'am. So for those of us who um, are ready to submit our first hours mm -hmm. that we submitted in the last six months, Yes. Um, we just need to give a high school diploma, and that will set our eligibility. How do we establish an eligibility? Because right now I Good. have a record. Yep. I don't have an eligibility date yet because I'm literally right in that midst of yes. They just submitted these forms for me. The NCARB yep. hasn't recognized it, so I yep. can't see the hours yet. Okay. So, <laughs> like I, I just mentioned, December 16th, that's when we're officially turning them off, so to speak. Once we turn them off, you're not actually going to have to provide anything, no high school diploma okay. or anything. We're going to see your college transcript, and we're going to assume you graduated high school. We can kind of. <laughs> I don't know what admissions is like here at FAMU, but I assume that the you know, high school is required. Um, and then we can then audit from there and just spot check to see if you know if things are working out right. Um, for those of you who are in the middle of the process, currently the system still allows you to report hours even without that form. You just see a warning that says you haven't yet established your date. So just ignore it, and eventually that warning is going to go away on December 16th. Okay. Yes. And I'll come around. Um, if you're uh, for pursuing an uh, advanced degree after a professional degree after like the MR, the MR mm -hmm. uh, what specifically can you, you can still get um, IDP uh, hours for that? Yeah, so we talked about advanced degrees kind of a, a little extensively here. Um, if you are in a degree beyond your uh, BR or MR, um, we have a list of probably over 100 degrees on our website that are approved for advanced degree credit. So check that, that list out. Most of them are specialties in architecture. Sustainable design or urban planning, um, or maybe some kind of research and architecture degree. There's some PhDs on there. Um, and it earns a lump sum six months of credit, whether it's a one year degree or a you know, 10 year PhD. So, does that, does that answer your question? If you can, and the Master of Science here, some of these concentrates and count, and it's on that list. That Great. Really so, the Master of Science in Facilities Management. There are a number of students in the program course that are actually working for firms. And I believe MLD is one, I believe uh, Barnett Transit Carlos one, and I know our firm was one. Uh, they will pay for your exam costs the first time. So ask them if you flunk it, you have to take it again, that's your cost. But the first cost is on the firm. And most firms do that, most big firms. So ask them if they will do that for you. <laughs> <laughs> MLD doesn't do that? Um, MLD, Maybe they should. MLD is. <laughs> <laughs> Here's the thing. Um, for us, it was offered to me. Um, I'm very prideful, so I did not do it. Uh, I did not want to feel uh, indebted. Indebted, right, to, to, to that particular firm, so I didn't take that. That's the idea, though. I understand. <laughs> But it's away from indentured servitude. Uh, I, uh, I, 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 
I'm, I'm prideful, so I didn't take him up on it, but he did offer. So. That's a good question to ask. Uh, Absolutely. The worst thing I can say is no, you know, um, but that definitely ask the question. Don't be afraid. <coughs> what, what, as you, as you, if, if you, if you moved into a larger firm, many firms now uh, really insist on you being uh, uh, folks, folks in the process by having lunch and learns, uh, paying for other kinds of experiences that allow you to get your credit. Um, if you go on, if you go on AI Florida's website or get in time, get in contact with them, uh, they have a list of intern friendly firms. It's a program that we just started about a year and a half ago, and they will direct you to those firms that really do mentor their interns through the process. They, um, they, you know, provide uh, adequate amount of uh, diversity in your internship experience. You know, filling out all of the eighteen categories. Um, a bunch of criteria that they that they meet or at least meet a portion of uh, to get that designation as an intern friendly firm. So do that. Never mind. Stretch. <laughs> Fixing the earphones. All right, guys. I really appreciate your time coming out and paying attention this long. And if uh, if you can help, give us a call. Let us know. Thanks. Well, one other thing. Nick will also be at the ProCraft course at 5:30 this afternoon, 5:45.